Hi, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Achieve Energy Efficiency Multiple Bottom Lines, which is a second talk of UTM Prospect Sustainability Best Practices webinar series. This event is organized by Process System Engineering Center of University Technology Malaysia and Optimal System Engineering Sandiam Perhat. This event is also supported by Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources, Energy Commission Malaysia, and Green Tech Malaysia. Hi everyone, my name is Jeng Shun, and I will be your moderator of the day. Just a quick background information about me. I'm a researcher from Process System Engineering Center of UTM. We mainly provide consultancy service on energy management and thermal energy improvement for companies and industry. For today's event, we are going to get some insights from our speakers on how energy efficiency and conservation initiative and proven technologies can be effectively adopted by packaging technical measures with policy regulations, economy instruments, and capacity building program. Before we start our session today, I would like to check whether you can see me or hear me well. So if you are able to hear me and see me, please drop us a message and say hi or selamat petang to our speakers in the comment section. Okay, excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome our distinguished speaker for our event, Mr. Zukifi Uma from Malaysia and Professor Zanuti from University of Malaysia. Hello, hi, hi everybody. Can you just say hi to audience? Okay, thank you to all the speakers. So before we start our event today, let me briefly explain the agenda for today. In the first hour of today's session, we are going to have two short presentations for the speakers. So if you have any question during presentation, just leave a comment in YouTube or Facebook. So when posting your question, please help us the special responder of your question. It may be directed to either one of the speaker or to both speakers, if you wish. In addition to that, some of you already posted us some questions during the online registration process. So let's assure that we have already compiled all the questions from you. And we're going to direct these questions to the speaker in the Q&A session later on. Okay. okay. Um, excellent. So now we can begin. So ladies and gentlemen, I believe some of you may still be in the shock of receiving the unusual electricity bill in the past few weeks. Okay. And I'm sure many of you may be disagree, agree, or disagree to agree on the calculation method of your TMB bill. But let us do a reality check-in. Are you aware that during COVID-19 period, Malaysia is actually enjoying the highest rebate for electricity bills in Southeast Asia? Back to March, our Prime Minister announced an allocation of 500 million ringgit Malaysia to provide electricity bill discount for all household tourism sectors, commercials, industrial, and agriculture sectors. Lately, together with TMB, our government has also offered free electricity to domestic consumer up to 77 ringgit per month for a three month period, not to mention some further discount within six month period. And if you are in a difficult position, we can even apply for bill deferment. For a quick comparison, how, are, how about our neighboring country, for example, Singapore? For your information, each household in Singapore is only going to receive a one-off $100 sing dollar to cover their utility bill. Um, of course, it may not be fair to compare among different countries where each country may be having a different energy scenario. But what I'm trying to highlight here is instead of complaining on something being given, maybe it's time for us to take responsibility to look within ourselves and identify what are the improvement opportunities within our organization, especially from the operation perspective. 
And in order for us to plan for our energy management activities, surely we will need to consider what are the available incentives or policy as the carrots to motivate us or the related acts and regulation as the sticks to ensure our compliances. With that, we are glad to welcome our first speaker from Energy Commission Malaysia. In the next 30 minutes, he's going to share with us some insights from regulator perspective on how major energy consumers from the private and the public sectors have benefited from energy efficiency and conservation promotion and implementation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Jugafi Uma, the Deputy Director of Energy Efficiency and Conservation Unit for Energy Commission Malaysia. Over to you, Mr. Jugifi. Thank you, Dr. Lim. Thank you very much. Thank you, UTM, for inviting me to, to speak at this um, webinar series. Okay, my name is Zulkif Liuma. I'm the, from Energy Efficiency Conservation Unit of Energy Commission. Um, I, I'm here today to share with you some of the initiatives on energy efficiency conservation that we have been conducting in Malaysia. So let me start with a um, bit of a terminology or, or terms we use in energy efficiency and conservation. Basically, energy conservation is relating to our behavior um, in using energy. The simplest thing that we used to say is switch off if not in use and only use when needed. So that is basically energy conservation. Whereas in energy efficiency, it's uh, relating to the technologies available to us in order for us to reduce our energy consumption. Um, for the easiest thing that I can think of now is changing of lighting to a more efficient lighting, for example, to LED, which I think everyone knows what LED is all about now. All right, a bit on Energy Commission. We are a regulatory body under the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources, which is now known as KETSA. Um, we establish electricity supply policy, prescribe electricity regulations and approve licenses and tariff. We also reporting to Minister of Economy under the Prime Minister's Department in relation to pipe gas supply. Basically, when it comes to the supply of gas through piping, it is under our jurisdiction. Uh, what we do is that we advise the Minister or the Ministry on matters relating to energy sector we develop legal frameworks in relation to energy industry. We implement policy. Uh, we issue, of course, we issue licenses and certifications. And on top of that, we regulate the electricity and pipe gas industry. Well, you can see here in this slide, the initiatives that has been taken since 1996 up to 2018. Um, I'm in the process of um, putting in the 2019 and 2020, but um, if you can see, we have done quite a lot in EE uh, since 1996, starting with uh, the EE program in the seventh Malaysia plan. And then uh, the biggest before that is what we call the Malaysian Industrial Efficiency Improvement Program, MIEIP. This is way before I took over this unit. Um, in 2008, we drafted our, no, we gazetted our first regulations when in, uh, in relation to energy efficiency electrical energy efficiency known as efficient management of electrical energy regulations 2008 or short for EMIR. Uh, I'll be using EMIR from now on. Um, 2009, when it, in relation to building efficiency, green building index was introduced. And then in 2013, we gazetted another regulation in relation to efficiency in households called MAPS, Minimum Energy Performance Standards. I will talk about that later. And then in um, 2016, we've started our Natural Energy Efficiency Action Plan, 2016-2025. This is a 10-year program uh, in reducing energy consumption on the demand side of about 8% from the BAU. And then at the same year, we started our 11th Malaysia Plan EE project known as Energy Audit Conditional Grant. And in 2018, the biggest one so far is that we have started drafting our Energy Efficiency Conservation Act. Um, so basically, those are the uh, trademark of what we have been doing so far. 
Well, in order to promote EE, we have to follow these four basic approaches uh, because there are quite a few variables that we have to take into consideration. Number one is economic measures. Uh, we have to understand the fiscal uh, incentive or ability of the people when it comes to EE. So we have to make sure that the measures that we undertake is the most common measures that can be adopted by almost everybody. Second is persuasive measures. Um, we do need to persuade people to create buy-in in order for us to promote EE in Malaysia. Uh, it is quite important because we have so many um, different levels of um, users uh, from individuals to association to institutions where we also need to get their guidance on, on, uh, on how EE should be implemented. Another one is prescriptive measures. This is where we come up with guidelines or standards and uh, which can be referred to by everybody. Uh, one most common standard that we issue is um, the Malaysian standards by the Department of Standards Malaysia. Uh, of course, the last one, we cannot go further from what we have done if we do not have any R&D and any demonstration project. Uh, the one demonstration project that we can um, that I can share with you is our is the efficiency of buildings in Malaysia. For example, our own building, the Diamond Building of Energy Commission, uh, the Malaysian Green Tech Corporation, uh, Geo Building, and then of course before this, the Ministry of um, Energy Building in Putrajaya. Uh, all right. Now, uh, now I would like to share with you. Uh, the first regulations that we have in Malaysia in relation to energy efficiency, known as Efficient Management of Electrical Energy Regulations 2008, or short for EMIR. It was gazetted in 2008, and it applies to anyone, or any institution, or any installation that is consuming or generating electricity equal or more than 3 million kilowatt hour in six consecutive months. So, Whichever installation, it can be industry or commercial, that has been using this much of electricity for six consecutive months, uh, then they have to uh, appoint a registered electrical energy manager. Registered electrical energy manager is registered by Energy Commission. So, of course, um, we have a pool of them. Uh, they can appoint one as their energy manager. And they are required to submit a written confirmation of the appointment. Whenever an energy manager is appointed, a return of confirmation of appointment must be sent to ST so that we confirm that the installation subjected to the regulation has appointed an energy manager. They also had need to submit a policy of their efficient management of electrical energy um, requirement, objectives of their efficient management of electrical energy, and accounts and documentation pertaining to that. Now, this has to be sent to ST so that we can keep records of it. Now we have um, used to be, we, the submission used to be uh, physical, but now since we have implemented a system known as Energy Management Information System, the submission can be made online, except for any signatories on the form, the form must be submitted physical to us. Um, these are the number of installations and number of energy managers appointed by installation. As you can see, the number is, um, about 1,900 number of installations subjected to regulation, but the number of energy manager that we have been um, uh, that we have been appointed as it has been increasing since 2013, we do have a few more to go um, in order to com complete the requirement. Uh, what I would like to share is basically the con total consumption of electricity by the con installation subjected under the regulations. Um, as you can see, 2011 is the peak of um, the total consumption. But just want to share with you the unit of it is terawatt hour, which is quite big actually, um, about 40 terawatt hour annually. Um, total amount of 40 terawatt hour is about 80% of the total industry uh, consumption, uh, Sunday sector consumption. So it shows that this 2000 installation, 1000 installation, is consuming about 80% of total industry consumption in Malaysia. The total number of industries in Malaysia is about 25,000. So you can see the big difference. Uh, this is the achievement so far. Uh, we also registered what we call energy service company because we have been promoting um, energy performance contracting in Malaysia. 
So in order for us to promote EPC, EPC will be done by the ESCO. So as requested by the ministry, we also started registering ESCO in 2013, and now we have a total number of 216 ESCO registered with us. All right. Uh, email just now is subjected to industrial and commercial installation. But we must not forget the residential sector. Okay. In terms of um, number of consumers uh, registered with Tenaga National Barhat, there are about 7 million residential cons consumers registered with TMB, about 1.5 million commercial consumers and about 25,000 industrial consumers. So when it comes to residential consumers, we, of course, we do not perform an energy audit in the household, but the owner can perform their own audit based on the appliances that they are using because it's much easier than uh, industry and commercial. So what we did is that, if you recall earlier, uh, I told you that I, I described to you that we use the basis of economic persuasive and all that. So when it comes to energy efficiency in residential, we have identified in the beginning, five common items that can that consume more than 50% of electricity in a household. Okay, uh, the five uh, appliances, uh, as you can see in the screen, is air conditioner, followed by fans, refrigerator, television, and lamp. And since 2018, we have included washing machine as one of the appliances that will be regulated under this program. Uh, they will be labeled using this uh, energy efficient label, which is washing machine. Okay, So the label ranges from two star to five star, uh, five star being the most efficient. Um, uh, except for lamp, lamp we do not use a MAPS label, but instead we put a ratings there because MAPS normally, uh, the efficiency is, uh, is based on a minimum value that we set. For example, an LED, uh, we set at 60 lumens per watt, for example, okay? Um, we have been calculating our achievement for the five appliances of MAPS from 2013 to 2017. We have um, accumulated a total of about 5,000 gigawatt hour of um, electricity reductions from the sale of uh, MAPS appliances to the consumers, which if you calculate it using the base tariff, it's about 1.6 billion savings for the past five years. Uh, sorry, for the past four years. Uh, we are also planning to include a few more appliances to be regulated under MAPS from 2018 onwards. And we expected the savings to double from that amount um, in, in upcoming 2022. Okay. Right. Um, the next program that I wish to share with you is what we call the National Energy Efficiency Action Plan or NIAP 2016-2025. Uh, it's a 10 years program. Uh, focusing on reducing energy consumption on the demand side for about 8% from BAU. Um, the slide will show you the design of the program where we have a guiding principle of sustainable development, efficient use of energy, increased competitiveness and welfare, and concerted participation with four strategic trusts, which is implementation of energy efficiency plan, strengthen institutional framework, establishment of sustainable funding mechanism, and promotion of private sector investment in the program. Uh, we have three key initiatives, that is equipment program initiative, promotion of five-star appliances, uh, and MAPS. Um, it's, it's a bit, it's, it's about the same, but for five-star is something that we want to push forward for people to purchase. But we also, we also have MAPS in place for those who do not wish to purchase five-star. We have industrial program initiative, which is energy audit and management in industries. And we also wish to promote co-generation in Malaysia. We have a building initiatives where we wanted to encourage buildings to be constructed or developed in an efficient manner. And we also want to encourage an efficient building design. That's why we have a green building index and green RE in Malaysia and MyCrest for the government to promote this thing. Okay. Um, these are the progress of NIAP since 2016 because we started in 2016. Uh, we have achieved our target so far, which is more than what we need to achieve. Um, as you can see, uh, at 2020, 2018 uh, alone, we targeted uh, a 1.77% saving, but we did achieve 1.8%. Uh, sorry, one point, we did achieve 1.77%. So 
we are on target actually and in achieving the 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 program and then um yeah the next thing i want to share is um we we have received a, some some amount of um funding from the government to promote energy efficiency uh, basically to promote energy audit in malaysia so what we have done is that the amount of money that we receive from the government we provided informal grant to any installation industry or commercial for them to conduct energy audit and then um, after the audit report is completed then we encourage them to invest the same amount of what, what we have given or more than what we have given um, in order for, for them to conduct retrofit at their premises uh, the retrofit uh, conducted by them is either financed by the owner themselves or they can use what i mentioned earlier the epc concept where the savings of uh, the retrofitting that they have done we will calculate it into our total energy savings that we are reporting every year okay right um the 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 one the, the one major outcome of this program is that we can see what are the most common measures that has been conducted by the industries and commercial sector and on top of that we also calculate the savings they have achieved but from here you can see that in terms of savings uh, for industrial sector operation um, daily operation work if you optimize it is the most common uh, measures that will be conducted second is a uh, uh, processing and third is compressor whereas in the industries aircon contributes um, not so much as what we expected but um, uh, it is still an um, um, important factor so so far up till 20, 2019 we have achieved about 54.87 gigawatt hour of savings which is about 21 million ringgit and company that undertake this program is about 108 companies as for commercial sector as you can see air conditioner is the biggest uh, measures uh, followed by lighting and operations so in commercial sector we have accumulated of about 7.6.72 gigawatt savings about 2.7 million ringgit in terms of saving and about 109 companies participated okay now uh, this is a bit detail on the ESG program for industries as you can see there are a total of 371 ESM implemented ESM as in energy saving measures and uh, the most is uh, measures that have been conducted is lighting excuse me installation of high efficient unit normally LED second in operation control and uh, followed by aircon system and inverter so these are the most common um, uh, initiative uh, initiative measures undertake by industry sector so when we want to conduct our own uh, the next program we will focus on this thing so that it'll be more focused on what we uh, or more focus on the most savings that we can achieve um, these are the in terms of kilowatt hour savings as you can see uh, operation control just now give the big uh, provide the biggest um, savings okay okay this is for commercial sector where as you can see uh, lighting is the most co most common measures that has been conducted but when it comes to savings aircon will provide the most savings followed by lighting okay all right um, the next program that we are embarking since 2018 is called building energy intensity label in government buildings um, the government sector is actually consuming quite a lot of um, energy uh, because we have lots of buildings uh, our public buildings so it is um, it is a decision of the government where we need to improve the energy consumption by buildings in the government sector so what we have done is that we have come up with an energy label approved by the government to be placed at uh, buildings that we have uh, audited and we have um, categorized their building energy performance and then um, it can be seen by everybody who is entering the building that's where the location of the the low the the label must be the rating is um is as follows as you can see on the screen uh five star being energy being having the bi ratings of 100 kilowatt hour per meter squared per year so we're measuring it in terms of um, the unit of kilowatt hour per meter squared per year okay. where one star is an any building with bi of more than 250 so 
the government buildings that we have audited so far, there are about four or five government buildings that is within five star. And then uh, mostly is within three star, three star uh, ratings. Well, the benefits of it is that we want to improve the energy performance of government buildings. We want to accelerate the efforts of making government buildings energy efficient uh, through the concept of government leak, by example. We wish to provide disseminate information to building occupants and energy usage performance of the building. We want to create a platform uh, where peer review government building performance is being conducted. Um, it's not it's not like uh, putting two, two and two uh, where we just want to create a peer platform, uh, a peer platform. And then uh, we wanted to help the government achieve the national commitment of reducing carbon emission by 45% by 2030. By 20, right. The purpose of this is basically currently for government buildings. We are not competing with any of the rating tools existed in Malaysia. But what we are doing is actually assisting them in, um, in a manner where the owner who wishes to improve their energy rating building, they can get the assistance of some of this uh, pro provider that is uh, placed on the screen. The, the other thing that I wish to share with you is what we call energy performance contract. The reason is because um, the government has approved the concept to be applied to the government sector in 2013. The main reason is because EPC, or short for energy performance contract, is a concept where it does not require any uh, front, cap, uh, paid, uh, front capital from the, from the owner. So basically what we do in, uh, what happened in EPC is that the ESCO, energy service company, will provide the financing for you to conduct your energy saving measures in your building. Whatever appliances or equipment that need to be replaced will be replaced by the ESCO based on the energy audit report that has been um, uh, put up by them. The, the energy report, the energy audit report will show how much uh, consumption that you can reduce if you were to implement each and every measures that they have um, uh, listed in the audit report. So, as I mentioned earlier, Energy Commission, with respect to implementing EPC, we have registered about more than 200 companies. Uh, and the companies that has been registered by ST are then required to, be, to register with Malaysian uh, Ministry of Finance under the code 222801 Green Tax Services. Okay. And, and then they can only do the work in the government sector. So, the illustration of EPC is as what you can see on the screen is that um, before, sorry, before you implement your EPC, your total bill is as for a certain amount, say 100,000 ringgit. When you implement EPC and you had a certain saving, say 20,000 ringgit a month, that amount is what you use to pay the ESCO for the period of the project implementation, which means that in terms of monetary, yeah, you might say you might not have any saving, but in terms of kilowatt hour, you have reduced from the period of during the period of EPC. When the period ended, then the saving is yours, and all the equipment that has been replaced uh, by the ESCO will be uh, returned to the will be given to the owner. Okay, the impact and benefits of ESCOs is that there will be no capital expenditure to the owner or to the government in this case. All the cost of investment will be borne by ESCO. Payment to the ESCO will be from the operating expenditure. That means that you don't, you don't need to come up with any capital expenditure. Saving on bills uh, and, ach and achieve the government's annual energy saving targets. Uh, improve energy efficiency management practice among owners. Drive the EE industry to be more viable with the involvement of energy service companies. Basically, we can also improve the, uh, increase the level of ESCO's businesses. Uh, ensuring a more comprehensive and sustainable maintenance program. Well, the best part at the end is all equipment system belongs to the government after the APC implementation. Uh, we are in the process of um, completing the APC guidelines for the government sector. And um, the, the APC guideline will... Uh, Will guide will will act as a guidance on how the EPC, EPC project to be conducted, and and how the government procurement method in relation to EPC project. We will also provide a sample contract of the EPC for the government for the government sector, 
And we also will provide guidance on the requirement of ESCO's technical aspects and evaluation criteria. So basically, uh, what we can say here is that moving forward in EPC in Malaysia is through EPC concept, you know, because um, it is not a typical project where in order to come up with an EPC methodology, you need to conduct an energy audit. Then only you'll find out what sort of um, measures that you need to do in order to improve your consumption. The biggest EPC market in the world is China at the moment, and the biggest EPC market in ASEAN at the moment is Thailand. So we have been adopting this concept so that we can improve EE in Malaysia, where it doesn't uh, it doesn't incur any cost to us as the owner. And um, that's my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Lim. Dr. Lim? Hello. I can't hear you. Sorry, I cannot okay. hear you. Okay. Okay, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So I just saying that uh, thank you for your presentation. So we shall see you again in the Q and A session later on. Thank so you. now for those that just join us, a big welcome to you. So you can actually drop your question in the comment section of YouTube or Facebook. So again, when posting your question, please let us know the suggested respondent for your questions. We will combine all the questions and direct to the speaker in the Q and A session afterwards. So with that, let us move on to the spe second speaker now. For our second speaker of our today's session, we are happy to have head of drafting committee for thermal energy components under Malaysia Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act. He shall share with us on why and how thermal energy conservation is expected to be the next big thing in the region in pushing the limits of industrial energy efficiency and conservation beyond COVID-19. We shall also highlight how game-changing pinch analysis has driven the organization to achieve multiple bottom-line benefits of reduced thermal and electrical energy, reduced costs, waste, and emissions to achieve competitive edge and significantly contribute to multiple sustainable development goals. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Professor Zainuddin for University Technology Malaysia. Oh. Thank you very much, Jeng Shun. Um, yeah. uh, first of all, I would like to test my voice. Is uh, Are you able to hear me? Yeah, Prof. Crystal right. clear. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for everybody, yeah, wherever you are. Maybe we have uh, participants from the furthest part of Asia, yeah, Middle East. We also understand there are participants from the eastern part of the region, and uh, of course, many from Malaysia. I shall focus on how uh, we shall move on to achieve multiple bottom lines, yeah, toward multiple bottom lines on energy efficiency. I will just uh, touch on what Azul has mentioned yeah, in his speech uh, in complying with energy policy, I would like to respond to the audience or ask the audience yeah, to think about has it impacted our bottom line when we implement the energy efficiency measures yeah, or if our organization are one of the organizations that has been mandated to reduce energy and send a report to the authority. Or are we just law abiding? This is something that we need to ponder upon in ushering the more challenging period during our existence yeah, in this uh, pandemic crisis, especially. And how, in particular, can we increase energy and resource efficiency, push the bottom line limits for energy savings by utilizing business model like the one that Zul has mentioned? energy performance contracting, leveraging on incentives and grants like EACG, 
in your country you might have your own schemes as well as incentive and raise use all this to raise and multiply our bottom line benefits and especially if that can minimize our workers casualty we should go for those first as opposed to yeah uh, downsizing or laying off workers in fact there are opportunities through energy efficiency for us to create more jobs with uh, energy efficiency initiatives and investment this is a bit outdated data but i think it still applies uh, more so when we uh, move on to post covid period yeah uh, energy efficiency employment has grown yeah in canada in particular and it's the same in the western countries who have implemented energy efficiency for some time also in japan yeah uh, has created a lot more jobs than it does for all other categories or you know, sectors and research has shown that energy efficiency employs in almost half a million workers especially in canada more than oil and gas which is also an industry a burgeoning industry in canada or telecommunications which we know as one of the uh, future trends to achieve multiple bottom line and build resilience beyond covid we need to realize um, and uh, practice industrial energy efficiency and conservation and leverage on the opportunity that zul has mentioned to us i'm sure in other countries they also have your schemes your policies your incentive standards and labeling the way we do in malaysia but we have to realize that yeah in particular when we talk about industrial energy efficiency and conservation uh, in the context of malaysia we focus more on electrical energy and the regulation so far is emphasizing on electrical energy but there is the bottom of the iceberg which is thermal energy that we can also capitalize yeah, significantly upon apart from yeah, leveraging or resource efficiency and uh, waste reduction this is the topic that i'm going to focus on now on thermal as well as resource efficiency why in particular i have focused on thermal energy efficiency research have shown studies have shown and experiences of uh, developed countries have shown that more than 50 percent industrial energy is lost in waste heat as you can see on the graph on the left hand side of my slide waste heat towered other types of energy efficiency saving opportunities by far and uh, recovery of energy for that reason in particular thermal energy from waste heat is the number one energy cost saving opportunity in industry so this is the topic i'm going to talk about how we not just minimize on industrial electrical but also on thermal energy and that hopefully will also lead us to resources saving waste and cost reduction so this is uh, about achieving or towards achieving industrial energy and resource efficiency multiple bottom line using a technology that has been quite well established but still under development in multiple resources scenario called process integration based on pinch analysis which i will define in a moment so i will talk about process integration and pinch analysis what and why is this technology is being proposed by us the 4p this is the how part of achieving multiple bottom lines using process integration based on pinch analysis and finally i'll have some take home message for us to remember process integration for energy conservation has existed quite some time ago in fact close to 50 years now so it started with the energy crisis in 1970s where we have uh, tools like the composite curves to indicate yeah, how much we can recover energy. Process integration leads us towards yeah, approaching maximum heat recovery. And uh, in fact, I could define process integration as a subset of industrial symbiosis. What I mean by industrial symbiosis is how we can also uh, think about uh, process integration in the context of circular economy because it encourages to recycle and recover our resources to the maximum 
I will talk about how it can approach the maximum recovery. And pinch analysis is actually a tool to indicate to us how we can reach the limiting point of resource recovery or the maximum limit of resource recovery. When we talk about production pinch, we mean production bottleneck or pro production limit. The same way when we talk about heat recovery, if we reach the limiting heat recovery, it means that we live, we reach the pinch of heat recovery. So that is how it is uh, being understood in the context of industrial energy efficiency. Process integration using pinch analysis is not just limited to energy saving. You know, over the years, over the last 50 years, it's been developed into a tool for complete resource conservation. In the bottom right hand side, I defined, yeah, this is what the definition that we have coined to represent pinch analysis as a resource recovery uh, tool. This is a systems approach, systems being integrated or industrial wide symbiosis or systems wide, and even it can be country wide planning for not only design, but also for retrofit or improvement of resource utilization systems and networks. And it has to be uh, going towards optimal, not just the maximum, you want it to be cost optimum as well. So next is when we uh, know about process integration, why is it important? Some uh, would say that, okay, if you implement process integration, how much it will save you? I haven't even looked at the plan or process or manufacturing site yet. How can you ask me how much it saves you? What is your plan? Where are you operating? How much are you producing? So basically, okay, we can still answer, but there are statistics that provides yeah, over 7,000 applications worldwide by uh, leading companies, multinational companies that uh, recorded about 10 to 60% saving over the years. So this is not just some saving, it is significant saving, and they are actually approaching towards maximum saving. Uh, and our experiences as well, over 500 companies, this is why we uh, need to share to others yeah, uh, to disseminate the knowledge so that people will also go for this technology in uh, ushering the new period of COVID pandemic and uh, raising or achieving multiple bottom line for energy efficiency. So how is the question that I'm going to address now? The 4P, we call it the 4P of achieving multiple bottom lines, energy efficiency. The thing is, I start with, some of us might have just heard about process integration or might have heard that uh, once in a while when we were at the high school or when we were studying in universities, but not much in terms of application in this region. So I'll start with what is actually holding back the implementation of process integration based on pinch analysis in this region. I will show the 4P, 4B first, the four barriers of EE multiple bottom line using process integration. Barrier number one, when you approach industry, many would say, yeah, if they have done a lot of energy audit, they will say that our EEI is already good. What have you got to offer? We also come across people who say, okay, we are not too worried about energy, but we are worried more about other resources like water and waste. And uh, many more will say that this will not work. Okay, this is, sounds very theoretical to me, very high level, very sophisticated. You might want to do PhD with this, but um, don't touch my plan. We got that a lot, so don't worry. This, is, uh, this will not work, that will go wrong. I've been uh, a plan engineer for my whole life here, working 50 years in this plant, there are a lot of things that will not work. So we'll get that as well. Number four, the barrier is, they want to know who else has done it and how much did they save. I don't even know what your plan is, so how I, I need to look at it first before I can tell you how much you, you can save. Let's uh, go on the positive side, the pushes of achieving the P, the four P or the four pushes of achieving multiple bottom lines using pinch analysis. Number one, pinch analysis process integration will push the limits of saving to the maximum or towards approaching the maximum theoretical. <clears throat> Number two, 
you will be allowed to prioritize beyond energy using the same tools of change analysis, not just considering energy, but also resources. Number three, we will show you some of the examples of practical implementation. Number four, uh, we will also highlight many of the proven cases of pinch analysis application. And one of the most, the biggest incentive or driver for energy efficiency, yeah, thermal energy savings, and pinch analysis uh, is essentially the law itself. And I'm glad that Malaysia is moving towards this, although we hope that it will happen in the next couple of years or so, but uh, we'll wait and see. So this is the game-changing act that will uh, change the situation. Even though if you have this such act in your country where energy efficiency is being measured in terms of uh, the quantum of thermal energy being used, from that thermal energy, you can generate electricity. In many other countries, they are actually measuring or mandating the act across, yeah, in terms of jewel, the content of uh, heat, rather than the content of electricity that you are being used, this is good, but there are still options, yeah? Many approaches, yeah, according to pinch tool that you can apply to achieve the multiple bottom lines. So push the limit of saving is the first one. Our energy index has been a benchmark in its class. Sounds familiar, right? So the first is actually, how can you use pinch analysis as a customized performance benchmarking? So current benchmarking approach, you do it company-wise. From one company to another, you may also pay for a database yeah, to look at uh, companies who produces the same product in your class and try to benchmark against other companies. You can also use historical benchmarking and uh, com compare against your own performance over time. Yeah, uh, On the first approach, company-wise, you need to pay subscription fee, and sometimes it can be expensive. But the downside is actually, it's a quick approach. It may not guarantee you have exactly compare Apple with Apple because uh, your plan and other people's plan across the world may not be exactly designed with the same settings. So there might be some differences. So use it with a piece of salt. Historical, you need systematic and continuous monitoring, but you won't know who else have done better than you or if you have reached your potential or maximum limit. Pinch analysis offers you the inherent maximum energy availability and requirement with the same setting or establishment, same thermodynamics condition, operating conditions that you have, you will be able to see what is the maximum possible achievement yeah, for you in terms of energy efficiency. So detailed audit in this case, the cons, the slight cons is actually you need to do detailed material and energy balances. This we have done as well. <clears throat> to put in a nutshell, if you have an energy recovery network like this, in green is actually the waste heat. In uh, orange is actually the heat requirement. So the thing is, the objective is to maximize green as far as possible, recycling of green, the waste heat, so that you can minimize the fat, the feed, the input of orange, yeah, the sources of fresh utility, fresh resources of fresh utility, fresh steam, fresh heating, or uh, fresh amount of electricity. So this is the red flag that you want to try to avoid by maximizing a lot of the green. So general aim is to maximize waste heat recovery as far as you can towards your own process systems, your own uh, site-wide uh, situation and your own uh, sub-processes so that you can minimize the fresh utility, fresh energy or fresh resources, or fresh water for that matter. So Pinch offer you the best achievable targets before design. This is the X factor where we can accumulate all the heat sources or the waste heat in red so that we can plot this waste heat by the temperature or quality of heat against the uh, content of heat. The blue is the heat demand that is required for your entire processes. So basically, the uh, pinch is actually the limiting factor that um, limits your 
ability to recover heat across your plant. And the uh, shaded region represents the amount of heat that you can transfer from the red curves or the cumulative amount of your heat available in your process plant to the blue curve. Yeah. So this way you can maximize heat recovery, minimize the utility heating or heat demand that you pay for. And at the same time, if you burn less, you also pollute less minimum emissions. So what is the advantage of this target? If you look into the two curves, this differentiates pinch analysis from our traditional learning curves at the top. The learning curve follow a projection of a comparison between what you have achieved now with the past achievement of other people. Say if you are comparing your plan in terms of specific energy consumption with other people's plans, then you may be satisfied if you achieve two or three percent better than other people's plan or better than your, your historical achievement. But pinch analysis will show you what is the maximum possible recovery. If that is 20%, then you can actually target straight to 20% from what you have achieved now. So it points towards the drastic improvement based on the energy targets or minimum amount of steam heating, minimum amount of electricity or minimum amount of wastewater that you have uh, to generate for your processes or you utilize for your process minimum amount of fresh water. On the other hand, the traditional curve is the incremental improvement. So this is the X factor number one for pinch. It's not just about target for heat, it's also target for a mix of utilities, not just steam, but fuel or water targets. It also generates profit targets, not just for design, new design, but also for existing process and existing plants. And it also shows us the practical steps towards energy, water, and emissions target as well, how to maximize cost savings and minimize plant changes. The cost targeting is also important. And now next, I go to the next barrier. Then we are well familiar with energy audit and has extensively conducted it. So how could you improve our process then? So we propose the P1B, pushing the limits of savings, but in process as opposed to end of pipe solution. Industrial process system energy efficiency may consist of this typical or familiar with us, boiler, condensate recovery, insulation, heat storage. These are the uh, bread and butter for energy auditors. We know that. These are typical utility conservation measures, but we are not quite seeing the bigger picture. This is just the surface of the iceberg. The bigger picture in a complete total site plan consists of utility, heat recovery network, energy guzzlers like separation and recycle system, the tall towers that you see by the side of, if you drive down Kelte Road, yeah, Parker and so on, the tall towers are not really only utility system. They are reactors, furnaces, and uh, all. So that's the bigger picture. So multiple bottom line, to push the limits of cost savings, you need to yeah, um, basically look at the big picture and ad address the root of the problem. So, say, for example, the reactor yeah, and move outwards. If, for example, you design a reactor to be not uh, energy intensive, you won't need a bigger utility system, not need, for example, 20 bar, 40 bar utility systems. So. This is the, um, we know that basically the more savings you get towards the inner part of the process, the more complexity, but there is uh, the need for us to actually uh, basically uh, look into the inner part of the process before we, and look at the process changes opportunity before we go uh, towards the utility system. We're saying that prioritize the inner part of the process for us to achieve 
bigger or more significant saving or multiple bottom lines. So other in-process and end of pipe solutions, end of pipe, say for example, you do water minimization, zero discharge, yeah, trying to clean up your process by um, trying to do water treatment and recycling is actually end of pipe. Water minimization, not to use water in the first place is actually the in-process solution. Rainwater harvesting is another example of end of pipe. Water minimization is the um, in-process solution and waste minimization is in-process solution. CCUS and CO2 reduction are other types of end of pipe and in-process solutions. So address the symptoms, you will get some savings, which is okay. But if you address the core in the process, you will see that in many cases, people have achieved up to 90% saving as well. So third one, barrier number three, is our plan has been delivered by, what if we have done pinch analysis? Will there be some savings? Yeah. You need to look at the bigger picture again, the plan-wide and total side, as opposed to equipment side. This is an example of plan-wide or process, a total site where you have many processes, multiple processes, not just one process, but multiple processes. I will say that you have three or four 40 bar boilers serving process A, process B, or process C. So these are multiple processes. So industrial process sites are typically designed by different vendors in silo, typically, because uh, vendors A, for example, is Foster Wheeler. Vendor B is Shell. Vendor C might be other companies, yeah, uh, Tokugawa, for example. So these are the uh, reasons why, yeah, if they were to do process integration, typically they won't communicate with one another because each process is licensed by themselves. So after a while, after the guarantee period, you will be able to look at opportunities on how we can do industrial symbiosis connect this process together. Process A, for example, has significant amount of excess heat that can be yeah, served to process B and process C. These are the things that we have done a lot and total site heat integration, industrial symbiosis has allowed us to achieve multiple savings in terms of uh, achieving multiple bottom lines, like for example, not just using uh, maximizing energy, minimize carbon emission, even using alternative energy, hybrid power system, renewable energy, saving water, saving hydrogen, saving materials, and design total site cogeneration system. P2, prioritize beyond energy. Beyond energy, we don't care too much about um, energy. We are in the Middle East. Energy is cheap. Water is uh, more expensive. Okay, pinch analysis also offers solutions. I will go quickly on this site. These are some of our publication. You may refer to them. How we stretch the limits of industrial and urban water savings. And this has been published in Chemical Engineering Magazine, a global magazine for engineering practitioner. Yeah? And, uh, and uh, this has resulted, uh, we, done, we have done it with uh, MIMO Semiconductor and has resulted in almost 100% savings. And this is holistic carbon planning, for example. Yeah, that um, uh, we have done carbon uh, savings for industrial park. And we have also done a suite or developed new techniques. We are among the pioneers in developing techniques for power pinch, yeah, renewable energy pinch analysis. And this has been. So basically, there are a host of other types of resources that we can talk about. And... Uh, P3, the barrier number three, practical implementation. When you see a plan like this, how do you begin yeah? process integration? We have operated this plan for 20 years. This will not work. That will go wrong. So we need to go through practical implementation. And if you see process PNID diagram like this, how do you actually find the needle in the haystack, look for opportunities to do uh, pinch analysis, energy saving? So we have gone through this and we just refer you to the publication that we have made on practical implementation. For your information, this is one of the top cited publication that we have in the world. The top 1% cited paper worldwide that discusses process integration, pinch analysis, industrial implementation issues. For your information, 
this student of ours who get PhD at a, an age of 50 something uh, is a process consultant for MNC such as Talisman and Repsol for more than two decades. So she is actually uh, have the trick of the trades. Finally, proven cases. Yeah, who else have done it? How much savings are you talking? So basically, I have uh, mentioned to you these are the stats that we uh, talk about, yeah? and uh, these are the uh, track records that we ourselves have done on, for example, water minimization projects, and these are among other uh, achievements that we have made on refinery petrochemical middle distillate, one of the largest middle distillate in the world. Uh, back in about five years ago, and oleochemical plants, and these are the projects that we have done, consultancy. And we also have our textbook that has been used worldwide uh, with uh, one of the leading figures in the world in process integration, Professor Rigi Klamash. Yesterday he was talking about plastic recycling, and we also have developed our own software, and uh, altogether we have more than 30 years experience doing consultancy, and this is our software on pinch analysis water pinch and certification process for thermal energy auditor and thermal energy recovery experts we have worked with uh, the secret is we have, we have worked with uh, regulators as well as industry and trained one more than 1600 energy managers involved in training them yeah our engineers has been involved in training them but that is uh, for uh, building energy savings and electrical energy savings for 4P energy resource efficiency, multiple bottom line benefits, push the limits of savings, customize your performance benchmark according to the pinch benchmark, go for in process as opposed to end of pipe solution, consider plant wide and total site integration, focus on the company priority, especially other resources than energy to achieve multiple bottom lines. You also have to consider practical implementation issues and highlight proven successful cases. I would like to also uh, inform you that we have master in energy management where pinch analysis is a very uh, one of our X factor feature here and our tools that we develop, our textbook is used in here. We cover not just uh, demand side management, supply side, management and technology. Those of you who have uh, undergone energy management, certified energy manager can get the uh, uh, Basically, the certification exempted, and you will be exempted one course, which is sustainable energy management. We also cover electrical and thermal, and we have a lot of software that we develop in-house. Yeah? We will do a preview on 9th July on this particular Master in Energy Management with a RIM certification. So uh, Azizol, Dr. Azizol, which is the program coordinator, will be talking about this uh, course uh, on 9th July. So stay tuned. At 11 o'clock on 9th July. Feel free to attend. So you can go back to this uh, recorded version later on if you want to look at the details. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Professor Zanuti, for your very interesting talk. So, with that, uh, let us move on to the final session of today's event to answer all the QA. So, before we start our QA session, Let's welcome back Mr. Zubufi to the screen. Hi, Mr. Zhu. Hi. Hi, glad to see you back. Okay, so I'm sure all of you are ready to answer all the questions for the floor. Give you a second, just let me put on the compound questions. Give you a moment, I need to share the compound question on the screen. All right, here you go. Okay. So this is a compound question from the registration form and also some of the question from the comment section. Okay, don't worry if your question is not included in the slide. We'll try to attend it later on for the rest. Okay, so without further ado, let's move on to the Q&A session. So question number one. Okay, so here, Mr. Chukiki, <coughs> SP has actually implemented the building energy label to classify the energy efficiency level for buildings. So just wondering what is actually the adoption rate so far? What is the way forward? And what what is actually in it for us? Why do we want to do so? What is the incentive? Okay, thank you, Dr. Lim. 
Um, the adoption rate so far was quite good. We have um, label more than 150 government buildings in Putrajaya and uh, KL. Uh, but at the moment, we are only labeling. We are only labeling the office type building. Okay. The way forward is that we uh, we have in plan to label hospitals, uh, schools, and universities. Um, we have been talking to uh, the Ministry of Health um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to come up with the ratings for okay. hospitals. Um, but as you know, after discussion, then we learn from Ministry of Health that uh, even hospital have quite a few types. Okay. The normal hospital, state government, there are specialist hospital, um, which then we have to uh, put into types of hospitals and come up with the rating. So we are in the final process now. Okay. We also planning to um, rate schools. Okay. Uh, but then we need to have a discussion with the Ministry of Education. Okay. Uh, on, on the rating tools that we need to come up with because there are also quite, quite a few types of schools. There are full-time yeah. um, yeah. boarding school, there are daytime morning school only, and so, so on and so forth. So that's what we need to do. Okay. The incentive is quite easy. Basically, it means reduction in the bills that the government has to pay. Okay. <laughs> that, that is the incentives that we are looking forward to. But there are also other type of incentives that is a reduction of energy consumption by the government sector. Okay. So, so uh, Mr. Su, yeah. may I say that uh, the current is actually more on implement for the government buildings? So at, the moment, have, yeah. Yeah, at, the, at the moment, my jurisdiction is only for government buildings only. Okay. I do not have jurisdiction to label um, private buildings. So currently, mm -hmm. private buildings uh, will have to use the rating tools existing in the market so far, uh, for, for example, Green Building Index and Green RE okay. and LEED and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your uh, opinion on this. So okay. let's go on to the next question. So I think this is the question everyone want to know as well. What is actually the status of the EECA? And when is the act expected to be implemented? Mm. So, and then um, related to this question, what is the government target of KPI towards energy efficiency implementation within these five years? And what is the direction of ST promoting energy efficiency? Wow, that's four questions in one, but it's okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, the status at the moment, we are in the process of... Um, finalizing the draft of ECA with the, uh, with our legal advisor, uh, the ministry's okay. legal advisor. And if that is successful, then we will submit the draft of act to the Attorney General's cham Chamber okay. uh, for uh, evaluation and comments. And um, if everything goes in, uh, as we plan, mm -hmm. we will try to... Uh, table the act to the parliament by June next year, June 2021. Okay. Uh, okay. That's that our target at the moment. Lah. So okay. in terms of KPI, as at the moment under EECA, the KPI is to get the act to be tabled to the, to the parliament. Okay. Once it is tabled, we have to decide on the implementation period for those who are affected under the regulation. Normally, we'll give them grace period two, three years for them to adopt, uh, to get used to the regulation and act. Uh, because we still have uh, four regulations that we need to uh, gazette with, with the approval from the minister. So EECA alone is a, a mother draft act. We have regulations that we need to uh, get ready and implement it together with the act. So that's that's uh, that's what we are looking forward to next. Lah. The okay. future direction of ST is quite interesting. Uh, I think we'll be doing what we are doing now, except that with a bigger scope, including thermal. As you know, currently our jurisdiction is on electricity only. But okay. ECA in, in picture, we then will have the authority or the power to regulate thermal um, requirement on energy efficiency. So that is the direction of it. So you are saying that in the future, we can expect more regulation in place related to the thermal energy? 
Yes, true. Maybe More similar no, regulation no, requirement. Okay. Ah, uh, not regulation but requirement. Requirement similar yeah. to what we have for electrical energy. Correct. Okay. So you know what to do for the future. So it's the time for the company to start planning right now to get yeah. more. Yeah, have to start. We have to do lots of buy in from the company lah. <laughs> so company, you are listening. So you know what to do. They know. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question. Okay, I think this question is directed to Prozen. So, um, Prozen. So being a student, how can we actually evolve and benefit in this? energy efficiency and conservation initiative and what could be done and also what are the courses that we can actually take on or what are the certificates you actually encourage us to, to take? Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I almost know the question so I uh, <laughs> put two slides on there earlier to show that okay. basically these are the courses <laughs> with certifications that we offer <laughs> at UTM, for example, and of course, with the kind uh, assistance with, uh, from uh, the authority, ST, as well as MGTC, we are able to, after some years, yeah, get buy-in from the government through our, through our practice of energy efficiency in UTM, and also our educators themselves being certified as energy managers and as REAMs, and uh, our curriculum meeting the requirement of the industry basically we could uh, with uh, some uh, uh, practical experiences students who undergo this course here yeah, doing projects with the industry will be able to move towards uh, rim certification yeah, professional energy manager certification as required by malaysia and okay. uh, we can also go through the route of certified energy manager yeah, with uh, the uh, cooperation of Green Tech Malaysia. So these are what you can uh, you can explore and uh, you can you can go through the routes. Okay. So thank you, Present, for your clarification. So let's move on to the next one. It's actually related to the previous question. So we know that actually RIM certificate is very helpful in the industry sector, but for academic sector, right? What is the advantages of having a RIM certificate? And how and when exactly people can use the RIM certificate? Uh, maybe Mr. Zhu, you can share some insight first. Okay. Um, okay. Um, in, in this day and age, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. very important for us to start savings, especially during MCO the other day and but, and also in our daily life, we do need to save. But sometimes we do need guidance on okay. how we save. So the RIM, I actually, I can consider a subject matter expert in advising people on how they can reduce their consumption. Okay. That is in a general term uh, for industry. For okay. academic sector, well, I can say that it's, it's never, it's always good to have an added knowledge. Okay, so being a rim is also being um, being able to know uh, what you can do or what you cannot do in terms of energy efficiency. You know, for example, I used to say that it is good to install a solar uh, and reuse solar for your consumption, but it does not mean that you have reduced your total consumption. Okay, yeah, but energy efficiency is about reducing. So that, that, I think that says from my point of view. Thank you. Okay, person, you have anything to add on on this? Topic? Yeah, I think there are four areas that you can benefit from as uh, academician. Okay. Yeah, number one is um, actually for you to get promoted. Yeah, that is very <laughs> important, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, uh, I think it's, we, we, have, we, we, we have a route where, whereby if you want to get promoted, then you have a, to have a professional certification. It okay. can be IR, it can be registered electrical energy manager, it can be certified energy manager with evidence. Then if you want to get promoted to senior lecturer or associate professor, then you have already paved the way for your promotion. So it is very important. I think if with that only reason, I, I, can, I, can, I can say, okay, thank you. But there are three other reasons. 
Yeah. Number two, if you were to teach courses, yeah, and you put on the first slide that you are registered electrical energy manager, you are teaching energy audit courses, then people will want to listen more. As Zola. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> okay, so you, it says that yeah, you have experience in doing yeah. energy audit. Yeah, you're not just yeah copying materials from uh, the internet or getting other people's uh, opinion and so on. Number three, try to get it first and see if your uh, uh, if your phone can stop ringing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you will get unexpected call. I wouldn't say that every day, every day people will call you, but if we, 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 with your name with Rim on the website, then uh, you will get unexpected call. That's what I can say uh, from time to time. Yeah, that people want to say, okay, can you advise us on this and that? And that means extra money. Okay, so th yeah. these are the things that I think uh, that can benefit far more than you ever think about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Uh, let's move on to the next questions. Um, so this is related to ESCG. So we know that ESCG is actually create a positive impact to our country in terms of energy efficiency improvement and energy reduction. So are we going to have more on this? What is actually the way forward for ESCG? And based on the previous experience, right? Uh, when you, uh, for example, when you implement the ESCG, what, what are the things that you think could be further improved to allow more industry to benefit from this ESCG? Okay, thank you. That, that, this is a very good question, actually. Um, in the beginning, it was not known as EACG. In okay. the beginning, it was like, um, it was um, a process of us uh, uh, trying to acquire some fund from the government Okay. to conduct a national energy efficiency action plan. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but as, as we go through the process, um, eventually it was named EACG because we did receive some fund from the government. Okay. And the fund, as we propose, is to be utilized as an audit grant. Okay. So that, that's a story of EACG. Lah. But uh, as we go along, we found out that we will have a great opportunity under EACG to do some benchmarking. Because as you know, we have different subsectors in the industry. And, and people have been asking us, uh, why don't we come up with some benchmarking um, on, to determine whether the industry is efficient or not, which we are not able to do before because we don't have any data on the energy consumption pattern of each subsector for every, for industry. So while we were doing this, we saw that this is an opportunity for us to actually gather the information and do some analysis and see whether we can benchmark each subsector, okay? Uh, in, in, in the NIA program 2016, 2025, we were supposed to audit um, about 4,000 installation. Okay, uh, that is under the, those are subjected to the email requirement, uh, the regulation. But as we go along, we know that it, it's, it's going to be a lot of money for us to audit this much of uh, installation. So what we did is that we, we select installation from each subsector. Then we offer them this opportunity, which fortunately, most of them accept. Okay. And we did the audit. So now we have the data. But as I, as I show you through my slides, it's still quite low from what we expected, only 108 from industry and 109 from commercial. So that's why we are going again, because we are at the end of 11 Malaysia plan. This is our last year. So we have, um, we will uh, put forward an application uh, to, to do another EACG, we, call, we will call it EACG 2.0 from okay. 2021 to 2025. Okay. So cross our fingers, hope that the, the funding that we requested will be approved. Okay. And we are targeting a bigger group of, um, of installation. The total number that we are expecting to conduct audit in the next five years is about 800. Oh. Uh, so okay. 200 from, from commercial and 600 from industry. And all of them are targeting on those email installation, which are using more than 3 million kilowatt hour. Okay. Then, uh, then we can come up with a better analysis of benchmarking. 
So we are also targeting from each subsector. So that is our plan. And we do want it to further improve EACG. Uh, mm -hmm. We do encounter a few issues during EACG 1.0, which okay. will, will improve in 2.0. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you for providing the information. Yeah. So to the ESCO company out there, so <laughs> for Mr. Zhu, I think you're going to be very busy in the next few years, okay, right. if everything go according to the plan. Yes. So just wait for the good news. Hopefully, we can get the good news soon. All right. Uh, next question is actually related to audit as well. But now we're talking about thermal energy audit project. So if a company has actually 100K, 100,000 to, to either conduct a thermal energy audit or pinch project, so, Prof, what, what is your advice for the company? Which project should be prioritized? And how does the, each of them essentially complement each other? Can you share some insight for me? It's on your practical experience. Um, if you look in the slides that I show, push the boundary of savings, the bigger mm -hmm. picture, where we have a circles of uh, layers of processes from utility, to heat exchanger network, to separation system, to reactor. Yeah, uh, they are actually connected. What we call as thermal energy audit, uh, typically auditing the boilers, steam system, and so on, is actually part of pinch analysis as well. It's just that they are end of pipe. Pinch analysis looks at the bigger picture from the reactor, separation, heat exchanger network, to the end of pipe. You'd be surprised to see that uh, the low-hanging fruit sometimes yeah, exists, not at the end of pipe, but actually in the, in the inner layer. Example I can give is actually one project that we have done on uh, just adjusting the column pressures. Column is actually the second layer after the reactor. The reactor is the innermost part. That uh, not any investment at all but achieve savings yeah, of 25% for that company in particular just by manipulation of the uh, separator pressure within the limits of the separator pressure. Of course, you do not want to yeah, adjust people's uh, columns or pressures uh, without uh, you any authorization or uh, exceeding the design limit is within sometimes the limits. For example, if you were to adjust a distillation column pressure, yeah, if it is still within the recovery of 99% product overhead, then you are in business. And it has to be sanctioned by the plant. They are, they are agreeable with what you are suggesting and recommending. So go, just like any other energy audit, go for the low-hanging fruits. Low-hanging fruits is no cost or even low cost, some heat recovery. But don't start picking cherry. Like, for example, you say, you go to the dryers, I'm interested in recovering heat from the dryers. I can do it for okay. you. I can uh, analyze for you. But uh, it's not going to, uh, you'll be surprised that you could save more by looking at the bigger picture. Uh, that's, why, that's why I can tell you. Low-hanging fruits, no cost, low cost, and not end of pipe, but go to the inner layers and move outwards. So, uh, Prof, in another word, may I say that you are actually suggesting yes, 100K. that... 100K is actually too much for no cost. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Prof, so okay. if Prof, I may okay. summarize, you are actually <laughs> saying that um, when you talk about boiler audit or thermal energy audit, it's actually focusing on the utility yeah. generation side, which is like boiler or whatsoever. But at the same time, well, if you may, you can actually... Energy. You will save energy, yes. Uh, if you yes, we, if you may look at the demand side, which is actually yeah. at the process side itself, the demand it can side. Yeah, it can actually potentially recover more energy. Yeah. And if we can reduce the usage, and mm -hmm. we can actually... There's no need for us to generate the energy at the first place. Yeah. You can actually okay. see that you can even... Uh, this, this might call for investment grade audit. For example, okay. ethylene cracker. Okay. Yeah, you can even install a CHP 
combine mm-hmm. heat and power if you your company uh, maybe is three to five years uh, investment your company is into that basically you don't need a utility boiler or 40 bar for example you can just generate through combine heat and power by the, from the ethylene cracker which actually operates um, the cracker furnace gas around 1000 degrees celsius 800 to 1000 degrees celsius and that can allow you to have very high pressure steam generation you don't need steam you don't need boiler so why do you well you want to uh, audit the boiler because uh yeah. plant says that you don't have investment or they don't have enough investment for the chp but don't you want it for the long term maybe you want it but for now okay we can audit the boiler for you if you make the decision consciously they are, these are the alternatives these are the long-term alternatives these are the grants given by the government and leverage on that capitalize on that you can actually um, benefit more multiple bottom lines okay thank you for your sharing Prof. so mm-hmm. maybe for the future ESCG maybe we can somehow to consider insurances actually as part of the scope as well to help mm-hmm. the industry to examine the mm-hmm. bottleneck in their process yeah, well, uh, people people may get allergy mm. about the term pinch analysis. What what is it really? As I said mm-hmm. to you, putting in a layman term, it is actually finding the limiting point for whatever recovery that you want. Yeah, recovery is related to industrial symbiosis or circular economy. But if you want to recover, where is the point of no return for you to recover? Can you recover everything? Can you recover cost effectively, but can you recover optimally and uh, to the point of uh, good economic return? Uh, that is the pitch. Okay, okay. All right. So let's move on to the next question, Prof. Um, so this is related to the pinch analysis as well. So what is the key area or indicator that you will look into? to advise the company whether they should go ahead with a pinch analysis, okay? For example, we know that the heat exchanger network of a typical plant could have already been optimized during the design stage. So do you think it's really necessary for such plant to undergo the pinch analysis again? And also the other situation is, um, what if a company would like to implement a renewable energy projects in their plant? So, do you think it's necessary for them to conduct a pinch analysis? So, over to you, Prof. If you haven't, uh, if you haven't, yes, you should definitely do so. If you have, then uh, we need to know what you have done. Okay. Always the case. Uh, the thing is, if I may connect to EECA or any regulations across the world, people have regular auditing, not just EECA. I, I won't be able to tell, Zul may know better about EECA, um, that people across the world, when they have energy regulations or energy policy, they will also have yeah, go together with that uh, regular period, say three to five years period of energy audit. Yeah, uh, These are the things that is going to be uh, a norm later on if not now, in Malaysia, possibly. But in the region, in Thailand, in Indonesia, elsewhere in the world, people have done it for a long time already. Yeah, okay. regular periodical audit. So okay. this is something that you need to explore using pinch analysis. And pinch analysis can tell you that basically, how far are you from the target? Are you talking okay. about 2%, 3%? If you are 3% from the target, we don't suggest you do anything. But without knowing the target, how could you tell if you need to improve or not? If it's three percent to us, it's diminishing return in pinch analysis terms. It's diminishing return, too much to expend with too little return. So if even you have done pinch analysis project, because that is the question I notice, then uh, have you done pinch analysis? Like I said in my lecture on a total site scale. Even if you do pinch analysis in the beginning, remember that when your plan was designed, if it's designed by different vendors, yeah, uh, typically a petrochemical, oil and gas is designed that way, they don't communicate with one another. How can I share with you my trade secret? You know, if you want, I would design plan A, you design plan B, 
okay what brings us together how do how, because uh, i have a different contract you have a different contract clearly they will be doing pinch analysis on their own for the different plants but they are not connected to one another pinch analysis okay. has proven that basically connecting the plants together plant a to plant b to plant c total site scale will give you a you know, significant more saving than if you do individual plants pinch analysis okay <clears throat> So, Prof, how about the second part on the renewable energy? Well, uh, I have also shown you a slide about okay. uh, power pinch analysis. In the total okay. site scale, a bigger site-wide scale, it mm -hmm. would be great for you to implement pinch analysis uh, as what actually Prof Sharifa is actually the developer of the technology, the pioneer developer. If you Google power pinch analysis, P-O-P-A, power pinch analysis, that's been developed over the last 10 years, okay. you will see yeah, a series of new technologies developed by UTM in particular. So the power pinch analysis is about looking at the optimal mixture of, if you want solar, biogas, or if you want uh, a mix of solar and biogas, and windmill, for example, which is not something that is a norm in Malaysia. So, and of course, a combination of fossil fuel. In a total size scale, you can also combine yeah, a development in a commercial area, yeah, not just an industrial area, commercial area with pinch, yeah, power pinch or hybrid pinch analysis. This has been done, especially in Europe. For VG Klamash, yesterday he was speaking, actually one of the uh, um, experts who developed this uh, technology as well in uh, commercial areas. <clears throat> So, Prof, what you are saying just now is basically related to the electrical energy. But electrical what energy. Are, yeah, but what if for yeah. thermal energy, for example, we talk about solar thermal. Yeah. So, do you think it will help the company to actually do a pinch analysis first to examine their process, existing process demand before embarking the thermal energy project, for example, solar thermal? Well, uh, you, you have to think about it... Um, in a generic in a generic in a generic context pinch will allow you to recycle resources yeah if you think in a generic context if that resources you have a waste resources a series of waste resources you name it if it's thermal okay. or if it's a, if it's a water or if it's energy then you want to recycle it simple concept maximize the recovery of the waste resources if it's a solar okay. thermal uh, don't tell me that we do not want to save solar energy from the sun <laughs> uh, <laughs> you do not want to save them basically later on you need to have a solar generate more solar generator because yes. it's just it's about the solar energy so solar thermal can also be recycled uh, significantly yes. if you have bigger solar uh, energy thermal energy usage then you want to recycle it to wherever is necessary but of course it uh, has to follow the rule of basically cascading the heat yeah yes the higher heat yes. level has to be cascaded to the lower heat level yes yeah. so i think prof you are you are actually trying to suggest that so for example if let's say we before we embark any solar process we should actually optimize the heat existing heat recovery in our plant yeah before so we embarking, looking for the external resource. Otherwise, yeah. it's actually just wasted all the energy that channel into the plant. Yeah, when we optimize, we optimize them in terms of not just the uh, amount of energy that we can save, the capital as well. Because yes. when, you talk about, when you talk about optimization, you save infinite amount of energy. You don't care about how much you expend in terms of mm -hmm, capital mm -hmm. investment. I don't think it makes sense. So you yeah. have to have a reasonable amount of investment for you to save that energy. Uh, that is how we optimize. The cost optimality has to be there when we optimize solar thermal, for example, for new design. Okay. So thank you, Prozen, for your clarifications. Let's move on to the next question to Mr. Jukifi. So... Um, yeah, this is actually related to ESCG as well. So we know that in Malaysia, our government is very kind, kind enough to give away the ESCG for the company to actually conduct the energy audit 
for their own good. So how do you actually rationalize the allocating budget for industry to conduct the energy audit? We should probably, they should have conducted themselves by using their own budget. Because after all, who is the beneficiary? The company itself, right? They are the one who paying the bill, not government. So what, what is your take on this? Okay. Um, well, I look onto the output that we receive. Um, the amount of money that we've given to the industry or commercial sector to conduct energy audit, if you compare to the output of it, the, it's, it's, it can be so, uh, seen as a very small amount. Nah? Because at the end of the day, we'll be saving not just in terms of consumption, but also all the way to the gener generation side where we can reduce our generation, maybe one day, you never know, and we can rely more on renewable energy, uh, not just solar, but any other wind or thing, something like that. So we are looking in that perspective. Uh, if we think about the amount of um, investment uh, against the return, the return is better. But the, 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 the other thing that I would like to share is... Um, when, when we talk about EE in Malaysia, I mean, the audience here or, and we ourselves are people who I can say have been doing this day in, day out. But there are many out there who's, who think that EE, well, might just be like um, going to work daily. You know? Whether it's there or not, I still have to go to work. You know? <laughs> so it's... it's um, Creating the awareness and creating the buy-in for people to conduct energy audit is, is not as easy as what we are discussing here. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, being in this business in, in the practical side, trying okay. to get people to, to conduct energy saving measures. I'm not talking energy audit. Eh? Just to do energy saving measures. For example, in the household. We okay. have a five-star icon compared to two-star icon, which okay. both gives savings, but five-star gives more. But in terms okay. of price, it's a, not a bit higher. It's higher than the two-star icon. Yeah. But when it comes to purchasing the icon, people will go for two-star because of the price. Yeah. So the best analog I can give. So in it's getting it's people to buy the five-star, you need to give them some incentives, maybe what we call discounts. And that will happen maybe once or twice a year when, when big retail store having a sale. But during normal time, the cost of five-star aircon and two-star aircon is, there's a big difference. There are a two-star aircon, which is less than 1,000 ringgit. But you rarely can find a five-star aircon that costs less than 1,005. I mean, that, that's a reality. So same goes in the EACG we are actually trying to create the buy-in for people to start conducting energy saving measures not to do audit okay. audit is yes, one part yes. of it, a very small part of it but to start okay. conducting esm that, that's a major okay. part that we want to target thank you okay strange now you are actually comparing purchasing the aircon with a uh, rationalized with the ESG, but somehow if you <laughs> it all fit into the place it's actually explained quite well. I mean, the analogy, okay, some people are reluctant to pay for the additional cost. Even though in the longer run, they actually benefit from it. Correct. But I think it's just like the mentality and also attitude. They may just want some uh, so-called uh, uh, incentive for them to move to the right path. Correct. Okay. So let's move on to the next one. Um, okay, interesting. This one talk about the real estate value. So, Mr. Zukifi, so how would you actually, um, what in your opinion, how would building energy efficiency project enhance the expected real estate value, which is expected to drop drastically post COVID-19? Ah, okay. Mm, the easiest thing I can, I can say is in, in relation to the bill you are paying, <laughs> If you have a smart home or building that is energy efficient, that means definitely the building will be consuming less energy. Okay. And even during COVID-19 or any mm -hmm. other day, you'll mm -hmm. be paying a bit less than normal building. I mean, yes. 
that's a that's a truth of the matter lah. So imagine you have an EE building or energy efficient building, for example, like our building in Putrajaya, mm -hmm. the Energy Commission building, mm -hmm. coupled with our solar solar rooftop, we are paying mm -hmm. we are paying a, the bill that is a lot lot less than buildings mm -hmm. surrounding us. Mm -hmm. nah. So that that is one advantage. Okay. Uh, um, in terms of real estate value, I'm not sure whether I'm the one to speak about it. <laughs> mm, okay. As far as I know, as far as I know, build in not in Malaysia. Um, okay. Some study done in Europe, uh, where building with a certain performance rating mm -hmm. are sold higher than buildings without energy performance rating. Okay. And as you know, in Europe, all buildings, including households, that's already measured in terms mm -hmm. of their efficiency. So, yeah, there, there is advantages in having EE buildings compared to none uh, because of number one is the bill. Number two, your building is uh, efficiently utilizing energy without wastage. You know? And number three, basically, uh, you'll have a good building where, uh, a good, like my building, we have a good cooling system, which doesn't cost us that much money to pay. Uh, which gonna be a bit an, an advantage to you. Thank you. Okay. I think it somehow struck my mind that when we purchase the car, quite, <laughs> quite often we will talk about the fuel consumption, right? Yep. I mean, how is this car? Okay, whether it's uh, consume a lot of fuel and how is it? But strange enough, when we purchase a property, really we think about that. What, what is no. the fuel consumption for, the, for this house? Yeah. What is the electricity bill for this house? So I'm not sure, but maybe in the future, there's actually a trend on this. Because right yeah, now, yeah. you already see that in car, you actually have different rating, right? Yeah. For the EV car or whatsoever. Yeah. So maybe in the future, we can also see the similar thing in the house. Yeah. But maybe, Mr. Lim, nowadays, if you buy a house, yeah. the developer normally include aircon as part of your purchase. So okay. you will be happy when you go into a house, you say, oh, I got free aircon. That's why you're talking about the building performance. But not for the bill. It's only free on the aircon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, okay. So, I think this is actually related to, to the earlier, our, our earlier discussion as well. So, um, will, will, do you think that the smart house technology will actually be one of the new requirements in the future house development? as it has been proven, it's very efficient in managing the energy. So what do you think about this? Um, I think so. Um, if our EECA uh, be enforced in years to come, mm -hmm. one of the regulations that we have put in is a building regulation, meaning that we want to have more smart um, energy efficient building in Malaysia, which you can also call them a smart building or a smart house. Okay. Uh, normally, an EE building will have a um, uh, building monitoring system uh, similar to smart smart meter, where you can monitor your consumption. Um, basically, most most or, um, almost real time, and mm -hmm. you can determine what sort of energy you want to use depending on the weather, depending on the condition. So yeah, I think that um, smart house will be a thing of the future. If you notice in iGEM. Um, it's, it's an event organized by the Ministry uh, International Green Exhibition. We Every year we have um, a showcase of smart house either by Panasonic or by Sharp, by who shows that <clears throat> the concept of smart house is where you can monitor your consumption. You can switch off which, whichever that you not use remotely and you can okay. switch off remotely. So okay. basically, I think it, it is a thing of the future in Malaysia, smart house. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for sharing about this. Um, just curious, it's actually just a personal question to present. Uh, Prof, <laughs> what do you think about the smart house? If given a choice, right, will you be, I'm just wondering, will you be able rather to stay, stay in, a, in a normal house or a smart house? <laughs> because we know that when we talk about smart house, right, it may have some, uh, we need to feed a lot of data to the internet, okay? <laughs> And all your data may be fit into the internet. So, what do you think about this, for Prof? I, um, what, what is your personal take on this? 
I have used a lot of smart other things. Why stop at house? <laughs> <laughs> so then, if, if, if you're okay with that short answer, then. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> okay, that so. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so I, I think the for those that who, who are selling the smart house, you know who you are going to look for. If let's say you are looking for an investor to invest in the house, in the house, Prozen is actually uh, very open-minded to this. Okay. So I will just share the contact later on at the comment section. So feel free to contact Prozen. Huh? <laughs> we can discuss. So, <laughs> okay, Prozen. So Okay, this is a very interesting question as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, is there actually a way to minimize the cost of the electricity or actually cut down the electricity cost without decrease its consumption? Um, <clears throat> interesting but strange. Well, uh, <laughs> there, there are two, 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 two answers that I can give. Uh, okay. Both, yes. Um, uh, one one direct answer is actually you can you uh, not sure if it works with house mm -hmm. but uh, for industry and for mm -hmm. uh, commercial buildings you have peak mm -hmm. and off peak tariff right? yeah peak and off peak tariff can also actually man, uh, can also optimize your cost yeah okay. uh, 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 given uh, different types of tariff that you can choose from so you can compare mm -hmm. tariffs well, uh, it is as simple as you comparing different type of telco companies, yeah, service providers. So tariff is also like that. The other thing is actually how about yeah, um, decrease electricity usage, mm -hmm. yeah, decrease electricity usage, but paying the same and mm -hmm. uh, better output. Use energy efficient lighting, for example. Eh? Mm -hmm. You actually don't care about the electricity usage mm -hmm. as long as you get the same output the same brightness for example why do you not want to save electricity if you get the same brightness so you want to save electricity in that case if you use energy efficient lighting for example okay you will you will you will pay the same you will pay less but you get the same output the okay. same brightness uh, so if you do not want to pay less then i, I will need the money then <laughs> from you. <laughs> from so from actually, present you are suggesting for the first one, maybe the they can look into the, for example, tar tariff switching yeah. to examine whether it's possible to switch to other tariff. Oh. And yes. then maybe also can look at their demand, right? Whether yeah. they can actually look, do some route shifting to shift their demand to the optic usage. Yeah, yeah I think like it's a very good suggestion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, let's move on to the next one. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Zukifi. Yes. So, this one sounds like a complaint, I'm not sure, or it's just a question. So, basically, why there's a decline use of solar street lighting and solar meter parking in Malaysia? So, could it be due to lacking in maintenance or otherwise? Well, okay. I'll be honest, I don't know much about this. <laughs> 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 it's about solar. <laughs> I do EE. I don't do RE. But I'm just kidding. Okay. 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 Um, I, I don't know. Maybe because of the price. Um, because if street lighting, mm -hmm. um, the cost of to install one street lighting at your house is, I think, not more than, what, 10 ringgit a month where you have to pay TMB, for example, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So if you can have a, a good uh, supply, from TMB for your street lighting, then maybe a solar which requires a good, um, what do you call that, generation of electricity, okay. uh, a battery to be installed, might be a bit more expensive than a normal street lighting. I'm not quite sure okay. on that. So uh, same goes to solar meter parking. So yeah, th th that's what I think. But I'm not quite sure why there is a decline. Uh, I'm not quite sure there is an increase before anyway. So yeah. <laughs> um, I really cannot give a good answer on that, but I think it's because of the cost to, to put up a street lighting, normal street lighting compared to solar. There might be a difference in there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we have almost finished the question. 
for okay. The next one. How ST will actually able to help in promoting the commercialization of new technology and measure related to E. For example, as, as a university, we are actually innovating a lot of things. So how how ST can actually help in doing this? Okay. Um we have many platforms to reach to the consumers. We okay. have our own platform where we conduct seminars and workshops and and normally we'll engage in a one day seminar where we do look for speakers or whoever that can come and promote a new way of doing EE. We will give them an opportunity to speak. And most of our audience, most of the times are registered energy manager, uh, industrial, um, industrial representative or commercial, large commercial representatives. We do call associations to join us like um, hotel association and hospital association. So it's, it's a good, it can be a good marketing platform to introduce the new way of um, improving your energy consumption, which can be in terms of technologies and measures to them. That's one way we okay. can do it. Um, we also, uh, in Comunicado, we always in contact with big associations like IEM, uh, FMM, which is always looking for ways to improve energy efficiency in Malaysia. And they have a bigger audience that they can get to, which we can also help to promote through them, uh, whichever is, is um, we, we, whichever that we know. Lah. So that, that is some of the platform that we can use in terms of um, our uh, relations with the industries. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I think we are clear what we can do to actually leverage on the existing platform for ST to promote our technologies. So, um, okay. So this question directed to present. So what is the prospect of pinch technology in energy conservation in the future? And what is the current limitation of applying the pinch technology in real industrial application? And what are the constraints and what are the biggest challenge of using this method in the future? I think um, this is actually related to the one of the questions that being asked by the audience, right? The audience somehow asked about um, pinch analysis is one of the way to uh, to actually improve the energy efficiency, but why is actually not widely being used? So, Prof, maybe you can share your thoughts on this topic. Five questions in one, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I start? Pinch analysis uh, for hmm. energy conservation, it's not just for energy conservation. You will see it's actually for resource conservation. Um, especially for example, in a paper mill, they are more concerned about water um, the, the, the huge amount of water that they use. Okay. This water usage is actually, if you save them, you don't save energy first, you save the water first because the water will, um, will, will actually allow you to achieve multiple bottom lines. Why? Because uh, they use a lot of energy by virtue of a lot of water they have to pump and heat. Uh, when, you, when you go to the in process solution, you actually want to reduce the water first and you will see automatically the multiple bottom lines will come into play. So the prospect, that is the question, eh, of pinch technology is actually not just in energy conservation, it caters for circular economy. If you think the circular economy or industrial symbiosis is the future, then I would say that, okay, it has a big future. If you don't think that circular economy or recycling is the future, then maybe uh, I would disagree with you. So basically, okay. pinch, analogy, pinch analysis has a bright prospect in the future because it caters for a tool for circular economy. And with respect to our friend, Hotani, who asked uh, why is it not being widely used, uh, wait until we have hopefully you know, pray for EECA, then maybe it will be used widely. <laughs> because that is for thermal energy. Now, you know, Malaysia doesn't have a regulation for thermal energy. 
It's been used elsewhere where regulation for thermal energy is quite strict. And if you have squeezed, squeezed your barrel, scrape your barrel for energy saving over the last 30 years, you actually, and if you are regulated by way of thermal energy, you would want to go to a new horizon when you can save other types of energy and other types of resources. I hope that answers this question. Okay, thank you, President, for your sharing. Uh, I think we have some further questions from the floor. Um, this question is actually related to Prozen. So I think he's asking about, in one of your slides, where you talk about 90% saving potential you mentioned. So can you share uh, some information on this? I also shared about 97 and 93% water saving. By that water saving with the MIMO semiconductor that we publish, in Chemical Engineering Magazine, which is engineering practice magazine that is being published mm -hmm. worldwide. They actually screened the article three times. And okay. one, actually the uh, plant manager to be also involved to verify the data for us to be able to publish. And we publish mm -hmm. with the plant manager who okay. actually almost achieved zero discharge. Yeah, 90% mm -hmm. is the lowest side of what I have shared 97 and 93 percent, 97 and 89, 97 percent of fresh water, 89 percent of wastewater, and automatically it gives the company energy saving of certain 20 or 30 percent. Yeah, because water is more costly for them. Remember, okay. water is actually achieving multiple bottom lines. Yeah, multiple bottom okay. lines. If you save water, you don't only save that water cost. You also save the energy cost for processing the water, heating, pumping. Okay. You also save the chemical treatment cost. You also okay. save the capital because you need lower size yeah, equipment. So that okay. is uh, not just triple, but four bottom line. You, you save cost. <laughs> you save the okay. Environment. okay. You can talk Thank about that. Yeah? I, I don't think everybody is convinced about that, but uh, it's just too tall a story. <laughs> maybe. I, I got that a lot. Don't worry. <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's normal, I think, for these kind of questions. Um, so the next one the, is actually asking about how do we balance between building energy efficiency and building comfort level? Let's say about reducing lighting may reduce the light level. So, oh. um, yeah. yeah. Jenzu, maybe you want to share some insight on these questions? Yeah, um, I've heard somewhere that people say uh, if you use LED, it might have some biohazard on your eyes. But mm -hmm. I always say if you look directly into the LED, of course it has. Like if you look directly to the sun, then, mm -hmm. then you're going to get some some sort of hazard on your eyes. But um, uh, that's why we have in place a Malaysian standards um, 1525. Code of practice for uh, energy efficiency and RE in um non-domestic building. We have another standards published a few years ago, which is a code of practice for EE and RE in domestic buildings. So mm -hmm. Malaysian standards are the minimum requirement that you can you need to follow in order for you to achieve some of the EE and E requirement that you wanted to adopt. So now we have both um, standards published, which is one for non-domestic building, 1525, and another one is domestic buildings. So in order to avoid any discomfort or any imbalance between building efficiency and comfort, please refer to the standards. It's available by Sirim. You can buy it okay. from Sirim. Um, or I don't know whether it's now Sirim or Standards Malaysia. But we ourselves in Energy Commission or other experts in Malaysia always refer to this guideline in order to create a balance between efficiency and comfort so that you will not have... Um, you will not have to wear glasses in two years' time if you were to do EE, for example. For example, <laughs> you don't wear glasses. <laughs> I, I wear glasses now, but I don't want to show it to you guys. <laughs> you should have told me earlier so that I can take off my glasses as well. To be in yeah, so, with you. Uh, so basically, we have a guide uh, published in Malaysia that you can follow okay. by use in order to create okay. the balance that you saw. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ju. Thank for you. your explanation. Um, I think there's actually one last question from the audience. It's talk about association. 
So I think this is more like a, to see for some general information. Yeah. There are many dreams now and not some of them, not more of them are for actually a score. I think basically they want to ask about what are the possible association one energy professional they can join. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been answering to the live comments just now. Um, mm -hmm. There is an association for registered electrical energy manager known as Malaysian Association of Registered Electrical mm -hmm. Energy Manager. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But our plan here, they couldn't find it in the in the okay. in the internet, and they say that the email the email has bounced. So what you can mm -hmm. do, you can email me. Uh, mm -hmm. My email is easy. My name at st.gov.my. Okay. L -E -E -L -S -T. okay. I will give you the contact of um, the Secretariat of um, mm -hmm. Mari. So you can contact okay. them yourselves and, and register as an as a member of um, Mari. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Sharifa just says here there is an FB for Marim. So you, you can you can also go to the Facebook to look for Marim in the Facebook. Okay. Thank um, you. So is apart from Marib, if let's say I'm an energy professional, is there actually any other organization or association that I yeah, can look into? Uh, we have also have what we call MEPA, Malaysian Energy Professional Association. Mm -hmm. um, well, hang on, what else do we have? If for ESCO, we have Malaysian Association of Energy Service Company. Um, so these are the ones that I know that you can join to become as energy experts in Malaysia. Thank you. Okay. Okay, President, you have anything to add on regarding the any professional body that one may look in, uh, okay. one may consider to join? These are the major one, right? For me, yeah, yeah, these are the major one. Now. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. I think we are towards now. I think we have answered all the question now. So um, before we end our session today, right? So I would like to ask both of our speakers to share your expectation on industry. So what are the actually take-home advice you have for the industry in managing energy for now onwards, especially on the thermal energy? Maybe we can start with Mr. Zhu. Uh, okay. Uh, been around um, the globe for, for some EE conference and things like that. I can see that, um, for example, uh, Thailand has an energy act, I think, more than 15 years ago. Um, of course, Singapore, long year ago. Philippines has just um, enacted, uh, no, uh, has just approved in the parliament the uh, EE Act last year. Vietnam is also last year. And, and it seems like everybody is looking into energy uh, reduction as a whole, not just from electricity perspective but also from thermal perspective. For example, Thailand is using kiloliter, where Singapore okay. is using gigajoule. Giga, giga uh, Vietnam is also using gigajoule. Malaysia is the only country in ASEAN at the moment that is using, using kilowatt hour. So <laughs> we are missing the big picture. That's all, what I will say. We are missing on the big picture because we have um, we, uh, gas Malaysia Berhad and Petronas Gas is also our licensee now. So we have requested some data from them to see what sort of gas consumption is being consumed by installation in Malaysia. And there are a total of about 917 uh, gas installation in Malaysia. But the amount of gas consumption that they are using, it's three times more than the EMIR consumption. Which means that we are looking on the smaller part of energy efficiency. We are losing on the bigger part of it. You know? so, so that okay. is something that, uh, we wanted to look into. Uh, and, and start analyzing uh, and start finding ways of improving our energy efficiency, not just from electricity perspective, but also from other type of fuels. Thank you. Maybe Prof. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Prozen, how about you? Do you have any uh, yeah, well, um, advice? I, my advice is uh, relates to my reiteration of uh, what I have stated in the take home messages. Yeah, to for us to focus on the 4P of achieving multiple bottom lines beyond COVID-19. You see, don't just abide by regulations. Try to innovate to stay competitive. 
even though the regulations may be about a couple of years down the line, then you still need to save money. Yeah, and uh, what you can do is actually to push the limits of savings to look at innovation and look at technology uh, because uh, people, maybe you have gone through the process and gone through the period where you have uh, encouraged and uh, motivate people to save energy, but the competition across the region, across the world, is now about technology more than just uh, housekeeping. So you need to look into more of technology on how you can push the limits of saving so that you can achieve, yeah, uh, not just energy efficiency savings, but also waste reduction, cost savings, and other material savings like water and other types of resources. So you need to push the limits by knowing the performance benchmark, you'll be able to push the limits of savings because otherwise you will start improving your own best practices or improving your friend's own best practice but you don't you don't actually uh, uh, we are not actually aware but what is the maximum limit available for your plan are you near the limit if you are near the limit you may not be cost effective for you to improve further except if you buy new equipment and then uh, you need to focus on what is actually if you are consulting uh, uh, you are advising some companies, you have to advise the company and what is the company's actual priority or company will have to advise you what is your actual priority. Uh, if it's energy, then energy it is. If it's actually other types of uh, priority, then uh, if you are a consultant, you need to understand you know, what are the uh, other savings, multiple bottom line savings that come across that will also um, uh, multiply your savings apart from just energy. It can be water. Water can also save energy and also save the treatment cost and save capital. And uh, you need to show practical implementation. There are a lot of uh, data and materials available across the world for us to benchmark what other people have used and highlight the proven successful cases. Though Those are the four P's that I have mentioned that will overcome the typical barriers that we have come across when we do this uh, uh, energy audit and optimization of energy, especially for multinational companies. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, President, for your uh, 4P advice. So um, before we end our session today, just a quick announcement for you. As part of this event, we are now offering special promotion package for those who sign up for our training services or products. So we will be giving away our software and signature training courses. But this is for limited time only until 31st July. And for more information, you can re refer to our website at optimasystem.my. And for those who missed part of our session today, don't worry. The recorded webinar will be available on our YouTube and Facebook channel. So once again, on behalf of the organizer and participants of this webinar, I'd like to say thank you to all the speakers and panelists. I'm sure all of us has received some valuable information and insight for your sharing. And for those of you who would like to say thank you to the speaker yourself, Feel free again to share your thoughts and love in the comment section of YouTube or Facebook. So I guess that's all for our session today. On behalf of the organization, or